1926, the largest manufacturer of steam locomotives in the United States would set out to change the industry as we see it. This was the pride and joy of the Baldwin Locomotive Works and inevitably would go down in history as somewhat of a failure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Railroad Explained, where we talk about the history of trains, their history, the mechanics, and more. And to, in today's episode, we will be talking about Baldwin Locomotive Works Pride and Joy number 60,000. <laughs> Before we start, as usual, we're going to have the disclaimer. Any and all information can be proven false. As such, please take everything with a grain of salt. If there is any mistakes, feel free to correct me in the comments. Not everything I research will, will be correct, especially with this locomotive. I would also like to put out in advance. There's a, basically no footage of 60,000. Basically, all of it is pictures. So please do not be surprised if there's filler footage. Um, I will try to keep the pictures though, to the best of my abilities. With that said, let us begin. During the 20th century, Baldwin Locomotive Works was the largest manufacturer of steam locomotives in the United States. Its main competitors were the American Locomotive Company, also as Alco, and Lima Locomotive Works. However, Baldwin was well known within the industry, well liked by the industry. While many of her of her steam locomotives that she, that she built over these periods of time still survive to this day we're going to be talking about the one that was meant to revolutionize everything the 1920s were the height of passenger and freight look freight service on the railroads of america every single manufacturer at that point that was in one way shape before making locomotives and making parts for locomotives were very very busy and as usual they were building bigger and better locomotives Baldwin that decided that they wanted to go all out and build the most advanced and most powerful locomotive built by the company to that date. As such, much of the technology implemented was either experimental or very, very advanced for the time. In 1926, Baldwin would roll out the new locomotive from the shops in Eddystone, Pennsylvania. She was the 60,000th locomotive to be built by Baldwin, and as such, the new engine will be known as simply as Engine 60,000. Like previous mentioned, Baldwin threw everything they could at this engine. She was a 4102 compound triple cylinder engine. Compared to vast majority of the locomotives at the time, they used two cylinders. A third cylinder was installed between the two outer cylinders under the smoke box to increase power. Not unlike a certain other locomotive. 60,000 also used a compound setup. This means using the steam twice through the cylinders. This is a popular image with, with compound articulated locomotives. However, in this case, it would be used on a non-articulated locomotive. High pressure steam was used in the center cylinder first, and then was, and the same steam was vented as low pressure into the outer cylinders. This helped increase efficiency. 60,000 also used a high pressure water tube boiler. So what does this mean? The vast majority of steam locomotives are fire tube boilers, meaning that the fuel is burnt and heat is sent through fire tubes, which are in, in turn surrounded by water. The heat going through the pipes boils the water, creating steam. A water tube boiler is the opposite. Rather than sending the heat through the tubes, it sends water through the tubes. However, that's a very oversimplified version. If you wish to learn more, I highly suggest looking it up on your own. The engine had a driving wheelbase of 22 feet 10 inches and a driver diameter of 63 and a half inches and a combined engine tender weight of 700,900 pounds. She provided 4,515 Jeremy Clarksons and 82,500 pounds of tractive effort. She was, especially at the time, not a slouch in any of the me in any means. She had a top speed of 70 miles an hour. As previously mentioned, she had a high pressure boiler. While not as high pressure as some other experimental engines seen, such as this one in the U in the United Kingdom, which operate I believe at around 450 psi, number 60,000 would operate at around 350 psi. Considering that a lot of late late superpower locomotives in the United States ran at around 300 psi, that is still considered a high pressure locomotive. 
60,000 was the first 410 to introduced on a lot of the railroads on the East Coast. Now, it's not to say that the West Coast was the only one running large locomotives. That is incorrect. There are plenty of East locomotives on the East Coast who ran large locomotives. However, there were also a certain amount that never did. And as such, 60,000 could be considered quite big for a time. A brief set of test runs were conducted at, by Baldwin, and once completed, 60,000 would be sent to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, there, at their Altoona shops, where they have a massive locomotive-sized dyno, uh, the Pensy would dyno her, her in for the previous stated horsepower numbers. Then, the Pensy would take her and use her for a free period for a short time, where she would hold a maximum of 7,700 tons. After her stay at the Pensy, she was moved to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and then from there she would just hop around the East Coast to various other rail lines being used and tested. On February of 1927, she would be sent to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. There she ran alongside the CB&Q's own M2 Santa Fe type locomotives. This would be to compare, say, fuel consumption versus ton uh, per how much tonnage that she could haul, and 60,000 came on top overall. She would do the same ki- same style competition with the Atchison Topica Santa Fe's own 2102s with roughly the same results. During the summer and fall of 1927, 60,000 would be sent to the Southern Pacific, where she was converted to burn, burn oil and, she- and would be run in both passenger and freight service. She would be then sent to the Great Northern Railroad with the oil conversion retained. It was found that 60,000 ran worse on oil than she did on coal and as such would be converted back to coal burner upon a return to the East Coast. Reviews on 60,000 were, quite frankly, not the best. While she did save water and fuels to a certain extent, it was never by a massive margin compared to other steam locomotives. Her compound design, which that gave that efficiency, was also complex a maintenance heavy. A common problem with, as like any other third cylinder engines, that third cylinder was an absolute bitch to work on due to the placement of it being right right below the smoke box in the frame. The maintenance crews must have hated it. We already know they hated it on, well, another locomotive. The boiler being a water tube boiler was also more maintenance hungry. The water pipes in the firebox were prone to bursting on top of having to clean them every more every once in a while more often and all the other issues that came with the water tube boiler system. There's a reason why we that the water tube boiler never came about in America as much as it did. Weight was another issue. At the time, the dick measuring contest between all the railroads hasn't quite begun yet. And as such, there weren't as many massive articulated running around. Well, that's not to say there weren't any. That's also to say that if there were any, they, that doesn't necessarily mean they were absolutely the massive beast that we would eventually see later in the later year. As such, 60,000 was known for leaving somewhat damaged tracks wherever she went. And the, any of the crews that ran 60,000 also found it somewhat difficult to operate. These multitude of issues culminated into no single railroad wanting 60,000. Another factor, while not necessarily an issue with, not necessarily a mechanical issue, but was another issue when it comes to railroad to manufacturer relationship. At the time, many railroads went through a manufacturer with cu- and custom ordered engines with specific specs. 60,000 was built without any single railroad really putting any input into it, and as such, she would never fit exactly what a railroad needs. 60,000 would be used as a stationary boiler for Baldwin for a few years. In 1933, Baldwin would donate 60,000 to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As the museum was being built at the time, getting her in wasn't the most problematic effort to be held. She was moved from local Baltimore higher lines to a temporary track set up in the, sle- in the streets. A hole was formed in the wall and she was put on static display. Unfortunately, her builders would never survive the rise of dieselization. 
Like most of other steam locomotive manufacturers at the time, Baldwin was late to create mainline diesels, or they didn't focus on them. And as such, they only had a small number of switchers. They did manage to create some that were partially su- successful, such as the shark nose, and some things were absolute pieces of shit, like the centipede. But in the end, it would not work out. In December of 1950, Baldwin would merge with the what's the now Lima Hamilton Corporation, with Lima previously being eaten up as well. In 1955, they would produce their last steam locomotive, and in 1956 would produce their last domestic engine at all. After which, Baldwin would cease locomotive production forever. Now, I am not here to give you a history about Baldwin Locomotive Works. For that, I highly suggest going to check out History in the Dark's channel and watching that video. But, long story short, Baldwin would, Baldwin would com- continue to just be bought out by other companies. And then eventually it all culminated in Greyhound buying the Baldwin Lima Hamilton Corporation in 1970, in which and then Baldwin would close it permanently. Ecolair Incorporated would eventually get the holds on Baldwin and would use the name as a part service. In 1991, however, the licenses ran out and the company dissolved, and the Baldwin Lane was forever written off in the in the books of history. As for 60,000, the Franklin Institute has made an effort to keep her preserved in decent condition. A whole section of the Institute is dedicated to her and the engineering of rail travel. However, due to visitors being able to climb in the cab, she is slowly falling apart in that area. She is absolutely not in the worst shape possible. By all means, it would be a lot better compared to some of the outdoor exhibits that steam locomotives inevitably get. But it could also be a lot better. For a short period of time, she could be moved back and forth a little bit by motors. However, as far as I know, that has since been disabled. The Franklin Institute announced a $6 million project to perch 60,000 in a current position and ha- in the current position have a new gallery below her with visitors unfortunately only be able to observe her. She and the other surviving bottle locomotives would continue to carry on the legacy of bottle locomotive works. But 60,000, well, sometimes forgotten, she was, for a very short period of time, the absolute pride and joy of Baldwin. And to that end, it is actually amazing that she survived. And rather unfortunately, she will also be known for being an ambiguous project that just inevitably never, never succeeded. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching today's video. Um, I apologize for how long it has taken me. However, I had previously had some microphone issues and a bunch of IRL stuff came into my life. And unfortunately, I was not able to upload for that period of time. A lot of you may previously have seen that I, for a short period of time, I uploaded a GG1 video that got taken down to copyright. So unfortunately, that video no longer exists and I will have to rewrite that. Well, that said... I truly hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Again, thank you so much for the support that you've guys given me so far. And I'll see you in the next one.